Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 58, What's the Problem? Discussing potentially problematic content in top tabletop games. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and as always, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone to the lobby here on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, today I'm going to be reviewing a game with a rather unique theme, one that some people may not like. After that, I want to have a free-form, unscripted discussion about potentially problematic content in tabletop games. Now, after that, we've got our usual look back at the games we played, where the big games this week for me are Zombicide Invader, Hot off Kickstarter, 55 flipping pounds of miniatures, and Imhotep from Cosmos Games. I've also got a bit to say about Lotus and Eminent Domain in the Week in Review. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we are going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. So, if you'd like to let us know something about our content, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, our first comment goes way back to our episode on do's and don'ts of gaming and pubs and cafes. Tyler Johnson writes, I agree it would be a good idea to ask the pub before you set up in there. I feel like it would be a good place for me and some friends to meet up at the local pub, but I wouldn't want to make the owner mad. I'll have to keep that in mind if I decide to use a pub to play some games with my friends. Well, thanks, Tyler. Just a reminder that our older episodes really are worth listening to. We really try to keep our suggestions ageless, so people can jump in at any point or go back and learn from our back catalog as well. Now... Nilla, uh, N. Philip Cole, a.k.a. NPC, contacted us about last week's topic. Heck yeah, we tackled a variant of this same topic on our show in our chat room right now. And Nope, sorry. Oh, we tackled a variant there? of this same topic on our show as well. Bikers, Dice, and Bars, episode number 28. He provided a link to the show that we're going to drop in the chat room right now, and we'll make sure to toss a link into the... Uh, show notes as well uh thanks npc uh i've been digital friends with nathaniel since the g plus days actually the very early g plus days i think he was on even when it was in beta and i do recommend this podcast bikers dice and bars well often about bikes and the portland dive bar scene has some great gaming content now another show on their network known as the breakfast puppies network i really dig is called have movies will game that's where they talk about a pulp culture movie and then talk about it in game terms and then in the end decide on a role-playing system that's best suited to play out that game or, sorry, play out that movie with that theme or play out the actual movie itself. Another comment on our camping episode, this time from longtime friend of the show, Emmett O'Brien. If you want to recommend an out-of-print RPG, you can't go wrong with Sherpa by Stefan O'Sullivan of Fudge Fame. This is a game designed for playing while hiking. The game book is 3.5, 3 and your character sheet is also a 3x5 card that you put in your pocket. It's a percentile system, so you'd imagine you need dice, but Stefan came up with a cool workaround long before there were dice apps. What you need is a watch with a stopwatch function. I suppose a digital stopwatch would work, and you could pass it around. You start the stopwatch and then stop it and look at the tenths of hundreds of seconds. Tenths and hundreds of a second. It's possible to game this. It would take someone with better reaction times than me because I couldn't do it. I still have my copy. Well, thanks, Emmett. And there's a clock app on everyone's phone, even if they don't have or want a dice app uh, to carry with them either. Now, finally, a message sent to your Tabletop Deals Twitter account at tabletop underscore deals. Justin, a.k.a. at the real Putnam, tweeted, Tabletop Deals. Thanks to you, added two new games to the collection this week, Splendor and Azul. Kids can't get enough of Splendor right now. Thanks again. Well, thanks, Justin. 
I gotta say, I love getting feedback like this. Like, I share a ton of deals, and it's always great to hear when someone's found a new game that they've fallen in love with, especially when it's a game they can play with their entire family and their entire family loves. Well, that's it for this week's comment. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We start Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern here on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, remember to stick around as we continue after the show in an off-the-books after show. Now, we're a little light in the chat room this week. We appreciate uh, Jeff and Sheila dropping in to chat with us, but storms in the area seem to yeah. have knocked people off and some very heavy storms in Buffalo right now, so I hope all of our regulars in that area are safe. Yeah, same thing with the uh, the east coast of Canada. We have some fans out there. The hurricane just went through there. I know there's some power supply problems out there. Uh, plus, I do know for you Americans, this is a, a kind of a momentous day for you. And I understand if you need some time alone today. Absolutely. I was uh, I was actually in New Jersey on 9-11. Uh, and that night got to uh, go look across the water at uh, where the towers used to be. It was... Uh, Lots of memories of uh, of that day. Yeah, so our thoughts are with you and your uh, memoriam up today. Absolutely. So tonight we are mixing things up a bit as far as the order of our show, and there's a reason for that, because we're going to start off with a review, and the review is of a game that has some content some people may find questionable. Uh, from there, we're going to break into a conversation about potentially problematic content in games, and we'll be looking for our chat room to take part in that full conversation when we get to it. We'll be back, stopping by the lobby again later. Now, on to that review Mo just mentioned. So today, I'm going to be sharing my thoughts on the non-collectible card game Tonto Core. This is an early deck builder that has its theme steeped in the Japanese anime art style, and Japanese made culture. Now, this year marks the 10th anniversary of the game, and Japanime Games sent me a copy of it to talk about because they want to start generating buzz for what is a new 10th anniversary edition that's going to be coming out this year. That's right, Japanese made culture. Nope, you heard correctly. <laughs> so, despite of what this game might look like at first glance, if you Google it right now or have seen the game in stores before, this is not actually an adult card game marketed to adults. It's actually recommended for ages 13 and up. And while some of the themes and artwork are suggestive, and that's being polite, it never actually crosses the line into adult places. Interestingly, this does seem to sort of generally be considered an adult game in America because of the sexuality of the images without mm -hmm. being actual, actually sexual. Now, in this game, your character, your players, you represent the master of a household who's going to be hiring maids with a resource called love. These maids service their master. That's how you take actions, is you are serviced by your maids. And many of the maids can be chambered. And what that means is to place the maid into your private quarters. Now, there's hard to deny, just with that one brief little paragraph, that little sentence, that there's something sexual there. But it's all implied. It's not stated. They never actually say you're doing anything with these maids. Like, it's weird. It's a, it's a Japanese thing, right? It's an odd mix of innocent, but totally not all at the same time. Like, you're not going to find any nudity here. And even the amount of fan service is fairly low. It's not like every card is a bunch of scantily clad women. There are just some of the maids who have a bit of upskirt going on where they're sitting in some suggestive positions. Now, in particular, the love cards are more risque than the rest of the cards. Now, this is all part of what I call Japanese maid culture, which is a thing. It's a thing that I actually thought there'd be a term for other than Japanese maid culture, like otaku or something. There is no Japanese term for this. And maid culture in Japan and now spreading through North America is a very popular thing. Now, it's not something I know much about, except for the fact that I knew it was a thing. Now, there is a really solid article I read from Inside Japan that tries to explain the whole concept. It's called Maids in Japan from Geisha to Kawaii Culture. I know I'm probably pronouncing Kawaii terribly. Uh, we're going to include a link to that in the show notes, and I'm sure Sean will drop a link into the chat room as well. Yeah, no, and uh, there's also a second link we're going to link in, which is uh, an older uh, article that's actually from CNN's blogs uh, back in 2012. that sort of tries to delve into a little bit uh, of it uh, from a, a slightly older perspective and looks at sort of 
how it is the how, what the difference is between what we are seeing and mm -hmm. identifying as a sexualized concept to what the Japanese are seeing, which is actually not sexual at all. So, based on this theme, which is pretty unique, some people are going to dig it. Like, there are people who are into this whole thing. I have friends that have gone to maid cafes, and they love this game. Some people are going to hate it. Some people are going to think it's a problematic. Now, it's this is what I would call a potentially problematic game, and that's why I want to have a conversation about pro potentially problematic games in our main topic later in the show. But for now, I'm just going to say... The theme of this game is what it is, and it's up to you to decide if that's something that will impact your desire to play or purchase this game. What I'm going to focus on for the rest of the review, though, is the gameplay, which I gotta say I was pretty impressed by. So we'll be getting more into that theme and the problematic the ideas later, so for now, just accept the terms for what they are, and we'll discuss mm -hmm. that more later. So getting into the mechanics and things like that, Tante Coro was released in 2009. Now, I don't know the exact date, but I know Dominion was released in 2008, the year before, and man, does it show. Like, it really shows. Tante Coro is very much a direct descendant of the deck-building card play of Dominion. Many of the mechanics of the games have direct ties to the mechanics in Dominion. Now, that said, Tante Coro isn't just a re-theme. It does do some things differently. Now, I already mentioned this. In Tante Coro, you play the master of a house. You're trying to become the king of maids, which I thought was kind of a unique choice of terms. I, I, what's odd is on the back of the house, uh, the back of the box, it calls you something else. But in the rule book, it says the king of maids. I don't know why they didn't go with something more gender neutral, to be honest, because a lot of the people I know that dig this game are female. Now, you are doing this by the tried and true deck building method of using your cards to buy better cards that let you buy more cards and even better cards that let you let you buy cards that give you points, right? That's pretty much every deck builder ever made anywhere until about Star Realms time where they started to figure out you could pack each other with these cards. Now, in this case, the cards you're buying are maids and the resources you are using is love. Now, based on my limited research, this seems to very much be a bit of a translation issue that leads to the, the giggly double entendre problem with this game outside of Japan. Uh, while love is love in English, it's a little more sort of uh, varied. And, 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 and there, there's more terms available to them in Japan in the actual Japanese, and that's probably what happens actually with the King of the Household problem as well, right. is there does seem to be some interesting translation. I was actually on the manufacturer's website Mm -hmm. And and doing some English, uh, some Google translation of the original Japanese okay. website, and seeing some interesting changes. So uh, we also have to respect that uh, you know this is a Japanese game that is mm -hmm. being brought over to English with the potential translation issues that uh, come along with that. So each player starts the game with the same starting deck, just like most deck builders. Uh, these are some basic love cards, and some points card scoring cards. Now, in the center of the table, there's the maid market with 10 different stacks of what they call general maids. Now, there's 16 different general maids in the game, but you only use 10 each game. So that's a good thing to see because that adds a lot of replayability to the game because of the different combos. Now, the town also has a deck of what are called private maids. Now, two of these are always pr available for purchase for hire at the all the time, but they come from a deck. And when one's purchased, a new card comes out of the deck. And this is the first major change from Dominion that you'll notice when playing Tante Coro. Because this adds a random element to which cards are available each turn. And I gotta say, this is a big thumbs up right there. That is something I really liked because one of the things I don't like about Dominion is the fact that it's a static market the whole game. Now, the other thing with private maids, though, is when you buy them, they don't go in your deck. Instead, they go directly into your playing area, into what's called your private quarters. Now, while in your private quarters, private maids give an ongoing bonus. Now, the neat part about the private quarters is it's basically t adding an aspect to this deck build that's completely missing from Dominion, and that is adding an aspect of tableau building. Yeah. So uh, one thing I've noticed, uh, private quarters are actually called chambers by a number of reviewers, I called it. So I wonder if there's, a, if there's been a change in printing at some point along the way. 
So what they do call it is you have chambermaids and you chamber them. And when you chamber them, you put them in your private quarters. Oh, okay. That's how it's worded in my rule book. Now, maybe eventually to simplify that, they just called the chambermaids going to the chambers. Possibly. But I got to say, chambers definitely sounds better than I take this maid and send her to my private quarters. Yes, it does. Uh, Also, I'll note that, uh, again, there are a number of fan creations for this game. And there are a number of uh, deck randomizers Mm -hmm. for the general maids. So that to help you get that different play all the time, um, it, there's a lot of support to this game out there. Yeah, it's popular. It's it's very popular. Um, so the other thing you have, like in most deck builders, are a bunch of standard cards that are always available to buy. Um, there's some point scoring cards. There's love cards because your love cards come in one, two, and three. So that's exactly the same as Dominion with your copper, gold, and silver money. Same deal. Um, there's also two event cards. Now the event cards are something. Somewhat unique to this because they're similar to the curse cards in Dominion, but instead of putting them in your opponent's deck, you play them into your opponent's private chambers. Uh, The two events that come in the base game, and I was a little amused by this terminology, is bad habits. You can give your opponent's maids bad habits and illnesses. Now, bad habits give negative points at the end of the game, whereas illnesses are played on a specific maid that's in your private chambers or your opponent's private chambers. And what it does is negate their card effects, so they're no longer worth points or do anything. Now, I kind of mentioned this talking to Sean already, but a chambered maid is any maid in your private chambers. Uh, These include the private maids, but also some of the general maids can also be chambered. Uh, I don't want to get into the details of it, but this whole chambering system is the biggest diversion from Dominion, right? This actually lets you remove unneeded cards from your deck, as well as leading to some interesting decision points where you have those general maids that do something for you, but are worth endgame scoring if they're chambered. So it's a, do I hold on to the card to keep hopefully get a few more draws out of it, or do I chamber it now before the game ends? Now, this is not something I've actually seen in any other deck build. Now, players continue to take turns with hiring maids back and forth and playing their maids and being serviced by their maids until two of the maid decks run out. At that point, game ends, players add up their points. All the points are on the cards, so it's just a matter of counting your cards. Player with the most points is declared king of the maids. Now, I don't know if I mentioned on the show before, but I know I did do a Dominion review. And I got to admit, I'm not a huge Dominion fan. And I was pleased to see Tante Coro did something fresh with those original mechanics. Yes, it still has a static market. But in addition to that, you have that whole private made deck. So new cards coming out. And then that adds a touch of variety and randomness that I can found lacking in the static market of Dominion. Then you add in that whole tableau building aspect, and you actually have a game that's quite distinct from Dominion, while still clearly showing its Dominion roots. Now, I have enjoyed every game I've sat down to play Tante Coro, and I'll admit, the first time I sat down, I was skeptical. This same thing goes for everyone I played it with so far. Most players, I gotta say, when they first see it, like, man, I wish I had gotten a picture of Mike Murphy's face when he first sat down at my table Monday night to play this game. Uh, But then the same players who were extremely skeptical, cracking jokes, by the end of the game, commented how surprised they were, how good an experience, and how good the actual gameplay is. Now, I did. I enjoyed this game a lot, but I gotta admit, it's not my favorite deck building game. This is definitely feels a little dated. It is from 2009. It's definitely showing its roots. Uh, There are many more modern deck builders that I prefer overall. Like some of the aspects, like the mostly static market, feel dated. And I don't remember the last time I played a deck builder that only has one resource to worry about where you're not tracking multiple things. But I did find some fun with this game. And if you're a fan of that whole Japanese made culture thing or anime art style and fan service, or if you're a big fan of Dominion and want something that mixes it up a bit, I do suggest checking out Tante Koro. All right. Well. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way for questions to get through us is to come through the website. They won't get lost in the mix that way. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, for today's topic, we're answering the question, what's the problem? As we sit down and discuss potentially problematic content in tabletop games. So I decided this was going to be a good topic to talk about on our show while working on my review for Tante Coro. Uh, This is a pretty heavy topic and not one I've heard talked about often, especially when looking at tabletop games as a whole and not role-playing games. I have seen multiple role-playing 
uh, shows talk about problematic content and safety at the table, but it's not something that comes up as often when talking about board games as well. And I thought it was a conversation worth having. And I do want this to be a conversation. That's why I haven't written up an article, right? Normally we come in here and I've already published an Ask the Bellhop article. I've already even gotten some feedback on it by the time we talk about it in the show. And I'll admit it, most of our Ask the Bellhop segments are pretty scripted. This one is not. Um, past this point, <laughs> we've got a bunch of bullet points on things I think we want to talk about, but I don't have any final opinions noted down here. Uh, to be honest, I have, think I have a pretty good idea where Sean feels on these things, but I don't know for sure. Um, I know where I sit, but I am also willing to have my opinion changed. And for those of you in the chat room, please feel free to jump in at any time if you have any comments or anything you'd like to add or questions for us. All right. So I think uh, based on that review, we're going to start off with adult themes. Yeah. So as we already mentioned, Tonto Corey isn't meant to be an adult game, for one thing. But you cannot deny that with North American sensibilities, that there's something there, right? Uh, the first thing Mike said when he said, what is this, some type of hentai game? And I'm like, actually, no, it's not. It's, to be honest, I don't even know the different terms for the different types of high school anime and everything, but it's like a sojin or whatever. It's The, the closest you are going to get is suggestion. There is nothing actual adult in it. But there are games that take this further. Uh, for example, there are two games that are very similar. Actually, Ferroticon being the one that is most similar to this, is a game where you are playing furries. You control a harem. You are trying to use your harem to make the opponent's furry climax. That is not implied. That is explicit. Well, and that's, I mean, now that is an adult game. Yes. Period. No question. Very true. Now, the problem with Tonto Quarry is actually a little on the different side. It's North Americans see it as a sexualization uh, and, and, and see the problem in the sexual aspects and the, you know, bringing chambermaids to your private quarters with love. Mm -hmm. That's where we now the, the now I still see actually see the game now that I've, I've looked into it more and I've read up a little bit more both on the maid culture and on some of the translation issues in the game. What I'm actually seeing is that it's a very different problem. Uh, there's actually a problem of lack of respect of women, not in a sexualization way, but in an almost subservient, um, subservient and objectified mm -hmm. way. So the maid situation in Japan seems to be more of uh, a man will come home from, a, you know, finish up a, a long business day and need affection not in a sexual or physical manner, but needs someone who just is there to take care of them and, and love them in a, you know, sort of giving all to you mm. manner. And that's really what the maid culture seems to be about from my reading. Uh, it's, it's not a physical attention. It's not a physical release. It is an emotional release. And yet right. it's still no better that women are being used in that yeah. way. The um, other thing, too, though, is there's also a very solid side of girl power to it with girls walking down the street Tokyo in the maid outfit. So there's there's the kawaii cult, cute culture aspect of it as well, where the women have kind of taken it over and do the ears. And there there is. But at the same point, I think a lot of it is an attention grabbing thing. It's one of those things where are they dressing sexual uh, sexually as a self empowerment? Or are they dressing sexually because they can get something by, yeah, you know, doing that because men want it? So that's that's basically no different than some women dressing sexually here in North America. Exactly. Uh, so it's, yeah. Deanna points out one of the things she pointed this out at the time. I was going to get to this is it wasn't the her problem with it, it wasn't the fact that the the maids were being sexy or that you were using love or putting them in your private chambers. It was the fact that a bunch of them look like they're seven years old. And it's true. There are uh, a couple of the characters. I purposely didn't put one in my review because she looked ridiculously young, like literally seven years old. Now, she also had a big ass gun. So very anime thing. And then that gets into a whole other thing that I haven't looked into is Japan. Japan is also really big on a Lolita culture. And the whole Lolita aspect gets combined with the maid aspect and you get some of the artwork in Tante Koro. Absolutely. And again, here we're getting back into the whole Japanese concepts of things where 
the women are supposed to be, you know, submissive. small, submissive, mm-hmm. respectful, yes. and small. And 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 when when you when you take what uh, what at least we think of as sort of the typical Japanese body type, the small petite woman, it's really easy to age them down, right? It, yes. it, they look young really mm-hmm. easily. And so a lot of that is what it comes to. So it's, it's the Lolita thing sort of falls naturally into their ideal body types as well. So even if they sure. aren't necessarily thinking about young girls, the, the concept comes out that way to us who, mm-hmm are expecting a, a grown adult woman to look a certain way, right or wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when we see that, their vision, it comes off immediately to our sensibilities as underage. Uh, so is it a problem that's in this game? Or is this game just representing a culture that's not our own, so we're kind of shocked by it? Well, it's this is a different one. Like, there's, there's other topics here that I'm a little, I'm a little more hard, uh, you know, yeah. I, I take a stand on. It's it's hard to say that something that is currently occurring right now is, you know, right or wrong. Um, you know, this is something, you know, the maid culture in Japan is something that mm-hmm. people have an absolute choice to do. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, some of those choices are encouraged by cultural norms and long term yeah. bigotry. Is that the right term? Yeah, it's it's well, it's one of those things where if, you know, it's they're doing it by choice. Uh, you look at something like strippers, um, you know, yes, it's their choice to work in a club to dance for men, but they're doing that because they have been, you know, men are enabling this Mm -hmm. derogatory. Well, plus plus there's the whole um, Um, human trafficking aspect. That's a huge part of the North American, which, which I do born in stripper scene, which I don't believe is happening in the maid cafes, but again, I I I don't say as far as I could tell, based on the bit of research I did, um, that didn't seem to be an aspect of it that I saw, but maybe that's something that's not talked about. I don't know. And, and so for for all we know, there could, there could be a, an adult maid culture, an adult maid cafe culture that I'm not aware of. Uh, so when I'm speaking, I'm speaking of the, the popular, you know, yes. the maid cafes that are out there mm-hmm. where they are dressing skimpy, but it is not about anything sexual. You know, it is about this, this sort of this caring and, and giving of one's attention to the client, not mm-hmm. physically, but emotionally. So uh, that's going to lead me to probably, it's going to be my point that I'm going to repeat a hundred times here tonight on every topic. What I think is important here when it comes to this game or any other game like this is to be aware of this. Be aware of where this is coming from. Be aware of that it, that it is a cultural thing and that our culture is not the same. Uh, be aware that it isn't meant to be explicitly sexual, but some people probably, and like it's a given, some people do think it's that way uh people marry their pillows in japan um which is a big part of anime culture over there i bet you there's someone out there who has married one of the maids from kante koro in japan uh but i think the important thing is to be aware of that and then put that into your decision whether you want to play the game or not i don't think people playing this game is harming anything um it's, it's interesting, and, and Anshi Gaines brings up a really good point in the chat room. So she says, uh, this is a case of something getting shifted in translation, and I can flow with that, but I feel like the publisher bringing it over to North America is well aware of the sexy risqueness here and is cashing in on that. And that's hard to deny. I mean, they are definitely saying North America gets off on ha- scantily clad anime women and we'll make money off that, even though in Japan, it's not about that. And that becomes a little more problematic. Um, do you support them because they are cashing in on the sexual mores of North Americans? Uh, you know, we could, I mean, we could go for hours probably on the Puritan origins of the yeah. North American... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in this case, I find it really hard to compare that any different from a suggestive Marvel comic covers or any other form of art medium that uses scantily clad women. Yeah, no, I, they're, I, they're both cashing in. Absolutely. Right? Like, I, I don't see this as any different. And I, this is why it's a hard topic. Well, I think the, different, the difference would be they are taking something that is 
Right. And I, I don't think it's all that seat. innocent in Japan either, to be honest. Like, I, I really don't. Like, like, yeah, she can have the maid culture, but she doesn't have to be bent over humping a pillow. <laughs> right? Like, like that's taking Fair it enough. that next step. Fair and enough. the love cards, by the time you get to the third love, the position of that third pillow is, is definitely suggestive. Fair enough. I don't know. I, like, it, part of it, it's difficult. Like, this, uh, it's not... Again, I'm gonna play, once we get to the other topic, I'm gonna say the same thing. This is this is one of the ways I, I think I can explain this is I am not a fan of the comics code. The comics code is something that happened, I couldn't tell you, the fifties, whatever. I don't remember when it happened, whatever it happened, and a whole bunch of people decided the comics were bad and you weren't allowed to show violence, you weren't allowed to show nudity and all this stuff, and they put out all these rules. And Marvel themselves broke away from this, and a bunch of really well known comic cards broke away from it because freedom of expression is important. And there are people out there who are going to enjoy questionable content. And I think that's okay because you're consuming it as entertainment. Maybe that's cathartic. I don't know. I am no psychologist. We need a Brian Kurtz in here to explain why people like playing violent video games and shooting each other and how that doesn't correlate to actually shooting each other and that it can be cathartic. It's the same kind of thing, right? And I very firmly believe in the freedom to create games like this for these games to be on the market and for people to purchase them if they wish. The step to me that I think is more necessary nowadays than I'd considered in the past because I hadn't even thought of it is now I think you have to take that step first to consider it, to look at it, to look at why it's problematic, realize that some people are going to find it problematic, realize why maybe you should find it problematic and then make a decision to go forward or not. I will fully admit it. I like titillation. I like sword and sandal. I like red Sonia. I, I like my boob plate in fantasy games. And I don't think that's horrible. I also think it should be equally represented and Conan should be showing off his muscles as much, right? Like I, I like the old Dieter Lisey art, right? I like the Braum backs. I used to collect heavy metal magazine and I still dig that aesthetic. And I don't think that's a bad thing, but I realize nowadays that there's, problems there right especially like sean talked about the objectification right the in class systems and implied class systems and implied powerlessness of women i see that and i get it more now than i ever did before but doesn't mean i necessarily think that all of that stuff's bad yeah again everything comes from a, a starting point and and understanding where that uh where that starting point is is important to understand. So you have to understand when you're looking at Red Sonia, when that character was created and when that art was drawn and where the artist was and, you know, in a worldview and even at that point. And the same with Tanto Kore. Um, you know, it, it comes from a time and it comes from a certain period and a certain space in the world where certain things mean certain things, uh, whatever that may be. Um, and, and knowing and understanding that framework for where the game came from is important. So another thing, too, is I find it really weird to people, especially North Americans, especially people south of the border, I'm generalizing here, obviously, get so damn upset about sexually suggestive material, but have no problem with sawing an orc in half with a chainsaw or a chain sword and that that's perfectly fine with blood spraying everywhere but oh my god this maid is next to a heart-shaped pillow possibly rubbing it and that is something i think it's a canadian thing because it, in it, canada it we we grew up much more uh, sexually liberated is not the right term but like there was nudity on tv and it was no big deal women can walk around topless downtown windsor and it's it's fine because we're both men and women so what we have different bits it's auto take your shirt off um it, there's definitely a different attitude there and I find it really weird that people have a problem with Tante Coro, but don't have a problem with a million other gaming topics that yeah. with the violence and the the killing monsters and which we're gonna get to some of that in a bit. But I, I like like this seems so innocent and harmless in comparison. Yeah, um, absolutely. Plus, uh, fetishes are okay again if it's consensual. And in this case, you're not hiring actual maids or Lolita girls. You're playing a card game about them. If that titillates you, cool. Uh, just you don't take it that step further, right? Like, no, absolutely. Uh, and it's it's really interesting. Uh, one of the biggest 
divides and that sort of drove things home for me in the the American Canadian difference uh, was way back in the day when the Ozzy Osbourne, the Osbournes, was on mm-hmm. TV. Um, now, I, I wasn't a fan of the show, but I'd seen a couple of episodes, and it was hilarious. And then I was on tour at one point, and I was sitting in a hotel room, and I turned it on, and the show was unwatchable because it was essentially Morse code, because they were actually bleeping out the profanity in the show, except the show was half profanity. So you were literally watching a show with Morse code played over top. (laughs) Um, yeah. it was, it was horrible. I, I, I don't understand how it became a successful show in America because you couldn't hear anything. Um, at least, you know, if you were able to understand it, you know, again, it wasn't for me, but I could have, mm-hmm. un- I could understand why some people would watch it in Canada, but then to find out that America where the show was designed for, wasn't even hearing it. Um, now I don't know if that was me, if maybe MTV wasn't doing that and I was watching it on yeah, network no. rerun maybe, but, uh, you know, just something as simple as that. Uh, yeah. you know, where you can't drop, you know, you can't say, you can't say sex, but you can cut someone in half with a chainsaw. Yeah. The, the, like I said, the violence versus sexuality thing is something I find disturbing, to be honest. Like it's, it's, it's odd. It is. It is. And, and that's, and that's very much, again, this good, this goes right back to what I was saying earlier with the puritanical origins of America, the, the country as a whole um, and, and again, this isn't an individual thing. It's very much a, a countrywide concept that has moved in this very anti-sexual mm-hmm. manner from its very origins, like from the, the Puritans who came over and settled the new world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they've stayed in that sort of strange mindset, um, historically. And it's, it's just, you know, they've, they've been trapped that way. Whereas, you know, you go to Europe and a nude beach is a nude beach. It's just a yes. beach. You know, you don't, mm-hmm. you don't think about that sort of thing. Whereas that's still shocking in America. Yeah. Japan has a very similar puritanical thing, which is why they're, they're. Yes. It's a very it, different it, it, puritanical. It's a very thing, different though. puritanical thing. And there's certain things that are still illegal there. That's surprising. And how they get around those. Like there's a reason tentacle hentai exists because they're not allowed to show the other. Uh, but that's another topic. Yeah. So one thing that it's, we're t- t- talking about sexuality in North America, uh, just to bring up another game here is one that is very much sex positive. Now this is an adult game. Uh, it was made in North America, I think in America specifically, and it is about the romance, the sexual encounter between a human and an alien. And you are playing that out, and the game is called Consentical. So here is a game that is subverting the ideas of making overly sexualized games by making an overly sexualized game, but it's all about consent and a loving relationship, which I got to say I find fascinating. Now, I'm sure there's people out there that are going to be very upset that Consentical exists, as much so as Tante Coro. Uh, that is a an actual game. I was in Deanna and I were talking about it the other night. I showed her pictures from it. I got to admit, I like the Kickstarter art better than the final art. No, I've never played the game. Uh, I'm somewhat curious. It's not really, I don't know, the, the, the alien human thing's a little unique to me. But there's a game, though, that takes this on its edge and basically says very clearly, this is okay that we can have games about this and we can enjoy this and we can talk about this, which I think is a great other side to this and instead most, of it feeling subversive. And most importantly, teaching consent, yes. which is just something that hasn't been taught. They are just finally getting around to teaching it in Canadian schools. I have mm-hmm. no idea what's happening in America, but I know in Canada, in the public schools, they are finally teaching it. Uh, unfortunately in the Catholic and private schools, there are still all sorts of problems with the, the sexual education that's Mm -hmm. happening, but they finally updated the curriculum for the public schools Mm -hmm. to teach people about gender and sexuality and consent. And that's something that we should have been teaching kids decades ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and if it takes an alien and a uh, human, yep. all the better. Uh, I am and, all and for that's this. The core, that's the core to me, the core, the core, the root of where I expected to end up with this conversation 
is this is all about consent. Uh, you are. We talked about cats. We talked about session zero. That's role playing terms, but that's what you need to do. Is if everyone at your table is perfectly cool playing a game about hiring maids and maybe making some off color jokes, that's great. So like when we started playing the other day, I could tell that one of the players wasn't sure because they had played before and the entire thing was people making sexually inappropriate jokes and it made that player play uncomfortable. When we played Monday, it didn't go there. And there was one point where it almost went there, which goes to an after show topic, which those of you listen to the podcast missed, unless you back our Patreon, where I was talking about having safety tools in board games and how there are certain games out there that could use an X card. And I'll admit, both Sean and I were both, man, which games? And we were having a hard time. Well, Tante Coral was one because we were playing Monday night and we got to a point where some basically someone X carded it because someone said, I finger the girl. And we're like, no, stop. No, back that up. It is you are using a service, and yes, the symbol for a service is someone pointing, but you're using a service to get the girl to do an action. You're not fingering the girl. That's taking it a step too far. We're here to play a game. It's not actually about that. And we backed it up, and we kept playing the game, and we didn't make that joke anymore. Yeah. And it, and to be fair, I mean, this is a really easy joke to make in this game. Uh, yes. Because, again, and we didn't talk about this during, this during the review, but the action of, of, of having someone do an action is you point service. at the maid to do to to have them do something uh and See, i was told it was actually someone snapping their fingers oh interesting is what that symbol is supposed to be is interesting you're snapping okay. your fingers to get the maid over to service you which that's again, actually the term service you. way worse than pointing to yes. have them do an action but, um, but <laughs> the actual term is a service you get one yeah. service a turn and you choose a yes. mer- maid to service you that is rules from the game Again, I'm not commenting on if it's appropriate or it's meant to be sexual or not. That is the terminology is service, but I was told that it was it was a snap the fingers, not a you go. Yeah, interesting. Which, again, yeah, it, it is what it is. It is, it is. Uh, yeah, again, I was watching uh, the Geek and Sundry uh, play of it from way back, oh, going back. Yeah, it's old. An, an old well, it was uh, back when Will and Felicia were the, the yeah. people behind it. Uh, and it was, I mean, they were having a hard time. Uh, Felicia loved the game, but it, you know, it was really hard not to make jokes during that play. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, now they're also comedians and, and well, that's, yeah. that's part hard of it. Hard for comed- I'll admit we made jokes. Yeah. yeah. Some were off colored. Yep. Some weren't, some were just funny, but you have um, to know where to stop it with your, yeah. with your audience. Um, and again, there's a difference again, because we're, you know, there's at some point, you need to sort of say, I, I, or I feel like there, there needs to be a say where a, a point where you say, okay, this game isn't okay anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. Like, you know, if someone That's were a- to create a game about uh, child trafficking, so you are playing child traffickers and the mm-hmm. cards you've got are teenagers that you're kidnapping. I don't know if I would be okay with that game being there, even if it was a game that people were allowed to have, you know, you know, everyone, everyone knows this is a bad game. I, I, that I'm not sure, you know, there, there are lines that I'm not clear should be crossed at, 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 for publication. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe that, maybe there is a place for that game to open up the discussion. Uh, I know the Wayne foundation has, you know, mm-hmm. you know, is I, I fully support their actions in stopping, uh, child trafficking and trafficking. sexual trafficking. Yes. Um, go, go support, go please give money to Wayne foundation. I support them wholly. So- but, so there is there is there is a game about human trafficking and it's a retheme of a game which I own, which is Freedom, the Underground Railroad. Right. And in this game, you are playing people helping black slaves escape Canada or escape the US into Canada right. through the Underground Railroad. Uh, this is a board game you can play. This is a board game some people are going to find problematic. It is a difficult topic and you're gamifying it. Is it okay to gamify a topic like that? Which well, kind of leads to our next section is the biggest thing being colonialization. Almost every Euro game ever made is in some way about colonialization because colonialization logistically is a game, yep. right? Like it's managing your resources, you're trying to expand your territory and you're trying to do it as efficiently as possible. You eventually want to build an engine to make that easier to grow your empire quicker. Like that's pretty much the definition of a Euro game, and it's pretty much the definition of what your what what Great Britain did at one time, and what all the other colonizers in the world did. Uh, so colonization is a fantastic 
theme for a game because they tie together so well. Absolutely. And some people have a serious problem with the fact that we are turning something that was very horrible to a large number of people into a game. And, you know, there's there's another way to look at it or another way to take it. You know, you can look at something. Uh, Terraforming Mars not, might not be the greatest example, but if you look at sci-fi games colonizing extraterrestrial planets, mm -hmm. there is a reason why we aren't, you know, throwing hunks of ice at Mars and, you know, nuking Mars to try and give it a, a uh, um, an atmosphere because we don't know what's there and we don't know what we might be destroying. That's why we're sending completely sterilized robots there mm -hmm. to learn about the planet. Uh, and yet there are all sorts of games out there about going and landing your, mm -hmm. you know, dirty spaceship onto a planet and walking around blowing up samples, uh, yeah. you know, collecting samples and things, which is colonization in the modern and sci-fi realm uh, and can be just as problematic. Uh, we just don't see it that way because we don't see a hundred years down the line when we see the effects of colonization. Whereas so that, that you're, you're still, you're talking about Petri dishes and, and uh, small single celled organisms compared to well, games like Mars, Mombasa, which are about British companies, exploit companies taking over Africa. In, in Mars you are, but there are other games where there are other, you know, sci-fi themes where you're going, you know, one man sky is a perfect example where you are yeah. going to planets of, you know, fully living, you know, not mm -hmm. microscopic being, you know, actual creatures and, you know, Oh, it's all great. Except, you know, whereas we know what happened in India, we have, we saw mm -hmm. the horrors that yep. were caused by the Imperial uh, control over India or the, and the, uh, the monarchy in India and, and some of the horrors that evolved from that. Mm -hmm. And we are, you know, in the sci-fi games, because we're in the future, we aren't picturing what's happening a hundred yeah. years or a thousand years down the line after we've dropped our dirty spaceship down and potentially wiped out an entire world of living beings. Yeah, um, I get that. You know, we know, we know what happens when we were really nice and gave blankets to the Indians in the new world. Yeah. Um, Interestingly, there are games that have subverted that idea as well, right? Um, I don't own it. I wish I did. I'm drawing a complete blank right now. Oh, I'll have to get back to it. There is a game where instead of playing the colonizers, you are playing the indigenous species fighting back. Right. Um, uh, speaking of sci-fi games, Cry, Cry Havoc. When you play three players, you're exploiting a planet. But when you play four players, the fourth player plays the indigenous tribe. Um Oh, the ones of Spirit Island. Spirit Island is the game where you are defending against colonizers. So it does exist. Uh, but there are an awful lot of games about colonization, colonialization. And I, I again, I don't think playing games with those topics is a bad thing. I, mean, I think they actually make really good engine builders. And again, as long as you're cognizant of what your board game represents and a good board game, is going to explain what you're doing in historic terms and how horrible it was. But you're not doing it yourself. It's like watching a sporting event. By watching a sporting event, you're not playing that sport. I, because I'm playing Puerto Rico doesn't mean I'm in favor of owning slaves and putting them in my cotton. I don't quite get that connection. Yes, I do somewhat agree with the 2019 woke mentality idea of maybe we could be making games about other things. And I agree, there are a lot out there, and I can't argue with that. But I don't distinctly think that games about games about problematic content, I don't think means they're bad games. I just think you have to realize and be cognizant and aware of that history of what's going on. Now, what publishers, I think, should do is be way more damn clear about what their game's about. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't hide it. Say, yes, you are playing a British company. You are raping Africa here's what this game represents. And because of this, you may not be interested in playing this game, but we think it's a really interesting competition that you may want to play out with your friends, yeah. which it sounds rather horrible when you put it that way. And it can be. And as D said in the chat room, learn history, ignoring it doesn't fix it. And that's one of the big things. If you are going to play a game with a theme, a historical theme, understand that and you know that requires the developer the publishers to help you but you know if you're going to play puerto rico understand what that game is about you know if you're going to play these games 
And if the publisher doesn't want to take the trouble and take the time to make it educational, then take your engine and wipe out the theme. Make it cubes on a board. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have to theme it. You know, it doesn't... Most of these games will work as an abstract. There doesn't have to be a real world example on there. Um, it that may have been where their concept came from. They may have, you know, they may have figured out their whole game by reading the history books about what happened in, you know, you pick a country, pick a mm -hmm. pick a, uh, a colonializing uh, uh, group. It, there's enough of them out there. It's really easy to find that source material. But if you don't want to help educate your, pu your public mm -hmm. and your purchasers about that, then once you've used that to develop the game, wipe the theme and make it an abstract cubes on a, cubes on a board. Now, one of the reasons I do think you should include these themes is wouldn't it be fantastic if someone played this game, a younger kid or even someone our age, and they went, man, I really want to know what happened. I want to research into this and they actually learn something and actually read some history and spend some time learning from our mistakes instead of repeating them, right? So Deanna made a point about learn history. Ignoring it doesn't fix it, doesn't make it going away. You don't want to be sitting there plugging your ears going la, 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 la. And if by playing a game about a problematic period in time brings more awareness of that period, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think... A lot of uh, what needs to be done is to sort of take a stand. If you're going to make it an abstract game, make it an abstract game. But if you are going to take a, a, a section of history that is problematic, make it a section of history that's problematic and make it clear mm -hmm. that the little brown meeple are slaves yes. from Africa. Don't, yeah, don't, don't hide sugarcoat it. Don't it. sugarcoat it. Uh, you know, make it clear that, you know, Someone could get uncomfortable playing this game, you know, you know, just put that content in there and don't try and whitewash it and make it a nice version of history because mm -hmm. history isn't nice and it doesn't help anyone to imagine it is. So that leads to another thing. Deanna's already mentioned this in the chat, but we've got this on our list to talk about. Um, I'm playing a war game. We're playing World War II. Everyone knows who the bad guys are when you're playing a World War II war game. If I am moving the gray tanks with the, the black crosses on them, does that make me a racist? I personally don't think so. I don't think that if I play the German side in Memoir 44 that I am glorifying uh, the, uh, I'm drawing about the fascists. And I don't think it makes me a fascist by recreating a historical war battle. No. Uh, I mean, because you, you have to remember that in the case of war games, uh, especially, um, everyone is their own, is the hero in their own story. Um, whether they, uh, you know, in, again, we can look back I, in history and say that no, Hitler was wrong. No, the Russians were wrong. But at the time, the Russians were doing what they believed in. And the war games aspect of it is just that. They were generals on a battlefield trying to do the best they could with what they had, period. Uh, and for the most part, that didn't involve anything to do with the greater plot Clark. arc of the political scheme. They were trying to keep their soldiers alive and kill the opposite soldiers, which is exactly what the British were trying to do and everything else. And, and narrowing down the war games in that manner... You know, you can you can put a lot of flavor text in the book about what was happening in the mm -hmm. background, but the fact of the matter is, for the most part, a general is there to keep his soldiers alive and kill the other soldiers, uh, in the best way they are able to with the equipment they with the equipment equipment and materials they have. Um, so the war games in particular, uh, separate from a, a the the larger political war games, because there are games out there that are political, mm -hmm. um, but the war games, you know. Army X versus Army Y is really a tactics thing. And again, you know, should there, you maybe, should you, should you divorce it from, you know, should you make it more abstract? Uh, I'd see, there are a lot of war gamers, every war game I know. I, I, I can think I can clearly state this and be true. Every hardcore war gamer I know is huge into history. 
Mm-hmm. Like they don't just recreate these battles; they read about these battles. They they yeah. collect books on it. Osprey Publishing exists because war gamers want to learn more history. Yeah. They are not just a game. They are an aspect of an entire hobby of learning from our mistakes and reading history and learning from it. Um, I actually think that people, like, they're there to open up that potential of learning, even more so than, say, I I don't think a lot of people are going to play Puerto Rico and then go and start reading a book about that time period. Whereas if you play out the Battle of Agincourt, you may be going, wow, how the hell did they win with that many archers and dig back into it and then look into all the history of the Hundred Years' War, right? Yep. Or the War of the Roses. I might be mixing up my wars here, probably, because I'm not a war gamer and I didn't dive into history. So, but I, every war gamer I know, like I, I can think of a few off the top of my head, uh, local war gamers. Heck, one of them owns a publishing company, but they're not getting a shout out. Um, and, I, I, like wargaming tends to attract that type of person, and I think it has opened up. I like libraries exist for it, right? Like I said, Osprey Publishing in particular uh, thrives off the fact that that wargamers also become history nuts. Yep. Well, I mean, you look at uh, you look at the recreationists. I mean, you look at those yep. people who go out and sit on battlefields with muskets, or you know, there are there are Roman warrior, there are you know Roman legionnaire recreationists mm-hmm. out there. Um, and, and those people are history buffs. I mean, the SCA isn't exactly re- recre- recreationists, but, uh, <laughs> those part. people are gamers who, you know, generally the SCA is a, what well, started off as a backyard game in California, uh, and has grown to something that, uh, you know, to more or less, depending on who you mm-hmm. are, is about history. I mean, my sister sits around trying to figure out how they created a, you know, 16th century Italian outfit so that she can do it in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, and, and it came from, you know, a backyard game of people beating each other up with sticks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there's, there's definitely um, a certain aspect and, and group of people who delve into the historical yes. knowledge and love of it. Um, and so I, you know, does that does that mean it's okay then? Well, I the think thing probably too is, yes. is the point of playing games is to have fun with your friends, right? We've said it many times, and it's a way to make things, especially war gaming, is basically a way to make history fun. Like that's that's why they were created is to add that competition, add that back and forth, and make things more interesting, as well as to give you a better idea of what actually happened. Um, just some notes from the chat. Jeff was suggesting if you want an indie story game that teaches about colonialization from the perspective of the indigenous population, he recommends Dog Eat Dog. dog. It's not one. Uh, we have stuck mostly board gaming related here, but obviously this is something just as important to role-playing games. Uh, role-playing games, I'm going to super generalize this. The biggest thing with role-playing games is, of course, consent and safety tools because you never know what's going to come up in a role-playing game. That's the difference in a board game is when we sit down to play Tante Coro, we know what's going to happen in Tante Coro. You can't suddenly have one of the players decide to do start beating his girls. In a role-playing game, that could happen. In a card game, that can't. You're limited. So role-playing, it's the the open nature of it where more of this has to be discussed and it's potential for any game to be problematic. Whereas board games either have problematic content or don't. Uh, It'd be pretty hard to throw some problematic content into a game of checkers, right? Like, (laughs) Uh, yeah, again, with, when it comes to RPGs, it's about the players. Um, You're and, and, and especially the DMs control over those players. You know, you could have a, you know, you could be playing D and D with a white supremacist. And mm-hmm. if everything is under control, then everything's great. But if the DM isn't going to control things and that you don't have any safety tools and that one person wants to go off and go way off base, things can go definitely sideways and yes. things are going, to, you know, it's going to be uncomfortable for everyone who isn't a white supremacist, um, which is hopefully everyone else at the table. Yeah. Um, oh. So going on that theme, uh, you know, Secret Hitler. Yeah, I, I'll admit I am not a fan of that one. I don't understand the appeal of that game. Very quickly after it came out, someone put out a retheme called Secret Voldemort. And I don't, anyone who I go, well, why don't you play Secret Voldemort? And they're like, well, I, uh, uh, I'm like, come on. 
So the only reason you want to play this is so you can pretend to be Hitler and, you know, make hand signals. Like, why wouldn't you swap? I don't get it. Secret Hitler's free. It's print and play. I uh, To me, that's a company that's just trying to put shock value, right? Like, now, the only reason they put that name in there. Now, to be fair, I've never played the game. So I'm I'm speaking. I'm I've got the I've got the board game geek listing up right in front of me. Um, you know, you are playing the chancellor, the, the president, and the chancellor working together to pass laws in Germany in the 1930s, and one of you may be Hitler. Um, you know, again, in in concept, it could be a learning tool. Whether it yeah, actually it's plays not. out it's that a, way, it's I don't a know. social deduction, silly. There's there's no learning experience there. You're not passing actual laws. You don't even discuss the laws. It just it, it, yes, if it, it could be a learning tool, but it's not. Maybe right. if the people who put the game out turned it into a learning tool, then maybe. Fair enough. Um, and it's interesting because I you know I see it and it's got a seven point six with thirteen thousand oh, ratings. People so, like it. Um, I don't know. So. I said personally that one I just don't understand why why it had to be secret Hitler. Um, I think so, that's my problem with that one. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, again, they were obviously, you know, when they when they took the Voldemort version, they went to the abstract. They took it yes. they took it from mm -hmm. black meeples on Africa to cubes on a board. Yes. Uh whereas in Hitler, you know, with Secret Hitler, it's it's not, you know, it's not black cubes on a board. It is white cubes in Germany. <laughs> you know, it's 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 white meeple in Germany passing laws to mm -hmm. you know do things with, uh, you know, do things against meeple with pink triangles and you know yeah. six sided stars. Well, it, it, mainly it was someone just trying to cash in on the hit that was Cards Against Humanity, which we've right. talked about quite a bit on this show. It is a game with problematic content, and again, even though I hate the game. I will say there are people out there that enjoy it. And the important thing, as I said with all these, I don't like the comics code. What are Cards Against Humanity? Sell it like crazy. The people behind Cards Against Humanity have done awesome things with the money that game's raised. I don't want to play it, but you might want to. Just have that conversation. Don't show up to my house expecting me to play Cards Against Humanity. If you know you have a game with problematic content, that's a, hey, is it okay if I bring Cards Against Humanity? I'll be like, no, I prefer you don't. Uh, don't just show up and expect people to play also, be aware, this is important for all of these games, actually, of the environment you are playing in. One of my biggest beefs with Against Cards Against Humanity is people who bring it out to public play events. Like, the cards in that game are offensive. They are. They might not offend you, but they're going to offend someone. I have been at an event where people are playing this, saying things about races that are at the next table over. Like, besides the fact that just uncouth and uncool, do you want to get in a fight? Like, like what are you doing? Like, you're trying to start a bar fight? Like, why? Why would you try to provoke the other people in a public venue that are just there to enjoy their night by calling out stuff like this? It's hard not to swear this episode. <laughs> it was actually it was actually interesting. Uh, it, I haven't played Cards Against Humanity specifically, but there was a similar game that got brought out at uh, a family event. Uh, and now the kids were all sent inside to watch movies, but, right. you know, and it was all adults, but it was still problematic because I'm playing this game with my sister-in-law and my mother-in-law and my brother in law yeah, and, and, and it was very much a, uh, you know, there were, there was a lot of sexual content and discussions and, you know, it's one of those things where, yeah, we're all adults here, but at the same point, I don't want to be talking about this kind of stuff. And there was stuff like, yeah, no, I'm just. Skipping that card. Sorry. Not, mm -hmm. not, not happening. Get another uh, use of the X card without an X card there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, I, I there's a bunch of them, right? Cards Against Humanity was the first. It's the most well done. There are people who tried to make worse games um, because, you know, that wasn't offensive enough. There are a ton of After Dark games. I Personally, I don't get the desire to turn a game that often, like Telestrations, for example. When we play that at 3 in the morning, people and there's been drinks it often goes there i don't see why you need to go there like implicitly like if your game goes there and you start getting into the sexual innuendos and people start drawing 
suggestive things and illustrations that can be pretty hilarious. I don't need a game where it's going to tell me to draw offensive things. Same thing with like apples to apples tends to get rather suggestive, but it's more that innuendo, right? It's it's the Tante Coro of card, like versus Cards Against Humanity. You're not quite there. Like the, the actual hints aren't pushing you that way as opposed to the explicit. But again, I'm saying Cards Against Humanity is a thing. People play it. People like it. Yep. Go ahead, play it. Enjoy it. I don't want to play with you. I don't want to be at a public event with you playing it, and I don't want you to offend someone else I'm with by being at a public event. Yeah. Save it for playing at home with a bunch of people who have enthusiastically consented to playing. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot of games that can go dirty, and if you're in the right group and you all know each other and you all have that cha and share that sensibility and sense of humor, you can go that way without the game pushing you that yes. way. Right, and that's what we've said all along. So oh. I think at this point, we're kind of going in circles. I think the, the main things here is first, I, Sean hasn't really said either way if he thinks they should exist. I personally think all these games should exist. I have no problem. My dad collected a collectible card game called Xenophile with three X's. Uh, it was in the Magic the Gathering craze, and they thought it'd be cool to throw lots of naked people and sex into a card game. Hey, whatever. My dad likes that kind of stuff. Sure, it's allowed to exist. It's not something I'm interested in playing. Consenticles out there. Here's a game turning that whole subversive nature, uh, exploitation on side, and making a game distinctly about sex that is sex positive and is is saying that it's okay. Both very cool games. I'm not interested in playing either of them. In the middle are games like Conte Coro, who suggests it. Uh, then there's Ferroticon, which I mentioned before. I They're all fine. I don't mind Mombasa, Puerto Rico, or any other colonization games. I do dig that we're moving away from that, that there are more games that have gone to other topics. Like Jeff mentioned in the chat, he talked about Concordia, which is all about the Roman Empire already being built. They've already done their bad thing. We're talking about the highlight of the area and doing merchants and trade ships and building up an existing empire. Cool. Uh, I'm all for that. War games play Nazis, yes. Play whatever sides. We're involved in the actual battles. It's about simulation and learning uh, about the time periods and head-to-head -head competition. Uh, Cards Against Humanity, feel free to play it. The whole thing, though, is be aware that these games have problematic content. Don't just plug your ears. Don't be the, 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 the privileged person who doesn't care and says it's just a game. Yes, it's just a game, but it's a game about something that may affect people, that there are issues, that there, there's more to it than the game, and be aware of that. But then make your own decision about it. Play it if you want, don't play it. I'm not here to judge whether you like games or what games you like, which games you don't. I'm just here to have fun playing games that I enjoy with other consenting players at my game table. Now, I, I'm going to say I agree. Now, what I will say, though, is I think there are some games that do exist his, from his historic point of view that should not <laughs> and, and, and should be put away. Uh, I'm actually looking at a, uh, a list verse post right now of uh, a quick little search for the 10 most offensive board games ever. Okay. Um, and actually, you know what, to be honest, I don't actually agree with a lot of them. Uh, I think a lot of these games are, you know, stop being approved. You know, there's a, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a memory game where you're matching Breasts. Breasts, yeah. yeah. You know, Bunch whatever. Of memo. Um, and actually, uh, in the in the chat room, uh, and she games mentions Ms. Monopoly. Game Monopoly is a thing. Uh, I haven't, I don't know enough about it, but I'm suspecting it may actually be offensive. But again, I, I think it's actually about gays and not against. Now, the number two and number one games on this list uh, the number two game is Five Little N-Word Boys, and I am yeah, just going to say it. And it is a pop gun target shooting game. Yeah, okay. That's... Uh, that doesn't exist. That, that, no, that, that does that... not need to exist. Uh, yeah, it is possibly one of the most offensive things I have ever seen. The number one game on the list is Juden Raus, which is German for Jews Out, where you roll your dice to go to the houses of Jews and the first person to collect and expel six mm. Jews from the city is the, uh, from the rules, the undoubted winner. Uh, and this was published in 1938, shortly after uh, the Kristallnacht in Germany. Um, and yes, it represents something that was historically happening at the time, but that does not need to be gamified. 
Um, Fair. And, you know, yes, I'm sure having a historical version of that in a museum somewhere is of value. But outside yeah. of that, that game doesn't need to exist. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a role-playing equivalent, Raho Wa. I'm not going to talk about it, but if people want to Google it, they could Google it. That game, no. Yep. Now, Fatal, despite all its flaws, that okay, sure. It's 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 a piece of... It, it, it deserves to exist as much as Alan uh, Crumb's artwork from the comic book periods right. for 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 similar level of lowbrow humor. But yeah, uh, there, there's a yes, there are some exceptions. I think to take it ridiculous too far. Yep, absolutely. I, I can't disagree with that. Uh, again, it's you know I, I look at I look at American free speech. Americans have free speech, but it is limited by the court. You know, you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. Uh, you know, you cannot make death threats. Uh, there are limits on free speech for a reason. And in the same way, while 90%, 99% of games should exist, and as long as you approach them with consent throughout the yes. group, go ahead. But that doesn't mean there aren't the occasional one that slip through that just need to be stopped. So yeah. now that we've either gained a bunch of listeners or lost <laughs> a bunch, and I'm not really sure which way that's going to go, I'm expecting I maybe get some mail one way or the other <laughs> on this particular topic. Yeah. Uh, we got anything else we missed in the lobby. I know there was some good stuff in there that was going through. All right, we're checking into the lobby here now. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going in there. So, you know, games are funnier uh, when the humor comes from the players instead of the game. Very uh, true. You know, very, very much. Um, moniker apparently makes you do charades for things like Hitler, Putin, or Sweet Baby Jesus. Mm. Again, if you know that's what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, kittens in a blender uh, make making people uncomfortable. See, that's one I'm like, oh, it, I haven't yet to see anyone uncomfortable for that by that, but I'm glad to hear it, actually, to be honest, because, like, really, what a kind of horrible concept. I'm, I'm pretty sure they probably wanted to do babies in a blender and decided that wasn't acceptable. Probably. Uh, and here, Jeff's just got a great point here. So the thing that matters most is the presence of glorification of these mm. themes. So if you are doing a an educational game that is putting the proper experience around G, about um, of, you know about the eviction of Jews from Germany during the Nazi occupation, that's one thing. If you are glorifying the extraction of Jews from their homes and mm -hmm. the ejection from the city. That's a whole different thing, you know. No, that's... I totally agree. That that that's a really <laughs> yeah. good point. There's Thank a you for there's that, a strong Jeff. there's a strong line there, and Jeff Jeff really put that well. Oh, that's good. Uh, uh, Deanna was talking about fire in the lake. Our friend Jason brought this over, uh, and with Neil and both of them. So here's an example of a war gamer who is into history. Right, dude became an archaeologist and is into historical games uh, because he wants to touch those time periods he can't be part of in a way. You can't really do any other way just by reading, right? There's something else that gaming lets you do. Uh, we played a game called Fire in the Lake. This is all about the Vietnam War. And, man, Jason and Neil together knew the history of the war so well and the Viet Cong and who the factions were. And he was teaching it to us while we played the game. And Deanna noted that was a phenomenal experience for her. And that made the game so much better because it wasn't otherwise. It was literally pushing cubes on a map without knowing the history. And I knew all the histories in the rule book, but as the person who showed up and got taught the game, um, she also noted Academy Games. They're the ones that make Freedom the Underground Railroad, as well as um, 1812, the um, War for Canada. Like They make a ton of war games, but all of them are steeped with tons of historic background, and they are so no well-known for handling topics delicately and properly that they now are in schools and you can buy teachers editions of all their games so you can actually buy a teacher edition of freedom the underground railroad so for your class or school if you are covering the underground railroad you can actually use the game to teach the concepts and what's going on in that game interesting major kayla is bringing up uh the 90s when dead baby jokes were a thing yes um, and it was a huge thing and you know what at the time i had thought it oh silly dumb jokes uh, later in life, uh, you know, my wife and I had a miscarriage, uh, mm -hmm. and things got a little more real and, you know, a lot of, it's hard to th think about some of these things out there, but it really is, um, you know, there really is a reason why these jokes aren't okay. 
Uh, sure. And I think to anyone who has lost a child uh, in any form, um, it's really not okay that, you know, you could literally walk into uh, Coles or an Indigo and see a wall of books about dead babies. Um, yeah. Humorous or not, it's um, disturbing. Yeah. Violence against children is something that completely changed for me once I had kids. Just just like stupid YouTube videos of kids doing dumb things getting hurt, I might have found funny at one time, and now I just like I can't watch them. Like I, it's almost to the point of, of like like I have to shut it down. Yeah, see, uh, I, see like, I'm on the other hand. I actually show my kids fail videos deliberately and explain to them why this why person kid, is an yeah. idiot and uh, why you should not be doing these things. Um, yes, I, I, one, of the, one of the lines you'll hear Deanna say the most in our house, so you did something stupid and someone got hurt. Uh, that is, we hear yeah. that a lot. But I, no, there's some of those fail videos that you like, there's just this one where this guy break dancing and there's kids, like there's a ring of people around this little girl walks in and gets kicked. Right. Like I, I, I'm sure before I might've thought that was funny or I'd at least have now I'm like, I can't even watch that. Like, I just think about my own kid getting kicked yep. and, oh, my God, that kid's got to be hurt. And, like, the video cuts off and I'm wondering if they're okay. Like, there's there's a definite change there. Yeah, no, I, I, I literally use fail videos as teaching yeah. experiences all, all the time idea. because, uh, you know, my kids are, you know, the kinds who, who would still laugh at that thing. They're at that age where, you yeah. know, things are funny. Oh, look, someone fell down. It got funny. You know, they love slapstick comedy. Uh, and I find a lot of the fail videos... Um, within limits there there are certain fail fail channels mm. that tend to show more extreme stuff and i won't uh, i won't go there but there's a couple of sort of general ones that play around the same level of intensity as america's funniest home videos used to um so um uh, you know those are the ones where you can get the teaching experiences in mm. there like look that guy wasn't wearing a helmet you watched how hard his head bounced yes. off the pavement when he fell off his skateboard <laughs> Um, it's not funny when he can't remember his name tomorrow. No, but well, uh, we kind of went off on a rant we did. there. <laughs> so bring it back. Uh, just to, to quickly summarize, there are games out there that have content that you may or may not find problematic, but realize there are games out there that people will find problematic. If that they're not you, there are people out there that are going to be bothered by some games. It's still okay to play those games. They're not necessarily horrible. There are some exceptions that are truly horrible. But the big thing is getting everyone on board and making sure people consent. And it, important to me is realizing the problematic nature of the games, acknowledging that. For board game designers and publishers, it's awesome to see that more of them are including the what actually happened in the back of the book. Endeavor is a great example of that. They fully explained that yes, in this game, there is the theme of slavery. We purposely made it so that it is a high risk, high reward way to do it. But we go forward in time and added time to the game so that the abolishment of slavery can happen in the game. And if you own slaves, then you're in trouble in the game, right? And they explain why all this was included, how it was included, and what it represents historically. I'd love to see more stuff like that. But even if it's not there, you can do the research yourself realize that the problem is there acknowledge that it's there and then make an informed decision on if you're still cool with playing the game these are games they're meant to be fun they're there to play with your friends and have fun with your friends but it'd be kind of cool if the four of you or whoever you're playing with also learn something at the same time absolutely well that's going to be it for this week's ask the bellhop if you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on gaming advice uh, if you got questions for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share with your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Uh, last week, we announced the winner of our Zentico giveaway. That winner was Corey O. Congratulations, Corey, and thank you to everyone who entered our contest. All right, we say it over and over again. We just said it again. We are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. We really are. 
We want to be a Dear Abby for gamers. Now, a new part of that is going to be answering your questions live once a month. Starting this month, September, we're going to dedicate our last show of the month to answering your questions live. So going forward, the last Wednesday of every month, we'll be doing an AMA or Ask Us Anything. I guess it's not Ask Me, it's Ask Both of Us. Uh, we're going to be taking and answering questions from our chat room live on the show. We're also working on a way for people to call into the show while we're recording, but that is still in the works. Uh, and also, we do keep Twitter open, so if you want to uh, hook a, hit us up on Twitter, we can usually uh, see things there, although maybe not quite as quickly as in the chat room. Now, next up, Join us Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop as the Tabletop Bellhop team does some live streaming. Now, usually we stream some online digital gaming uh, between the three of us, but this week we're going to try to mix it up a bit and we're going to take a look at some tabletop gaming Kickstarters. So join us in the lobby here in our chat room on Twitch as I suggest some gaming Kickstarter projects to look at and we discuss what we find live. So the next big event on our road to Extra Life 2019 is going to hit on September 28th. That's coming up quick. This is our big RPG role-playing game event, currently being called Level Up with Extra Life. The event will be held at the CG Realm on Tecumseh and Hall, uh, Tecumseh and Hall, and will feature a wide variety of role-playing games being run by some great local game masters, including Victoria Rogers of the Broadswords. Uh, there's going to be two seatings, one running from noon till four, another one running from 6 p.m. till 10 p.m. In between, we're hosting an RPG book exchange, which is a great way to get rid of some of your old books and that you're no longer using and pick up something new. The cost to play in a game session will be $5 per session, and there'll be a $2 buy-in for the book exchange. Now, 100%, every penny of this money is going direct to Extra Life in support of the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at TabletopBellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. Uh, so I got quite a pile of games this week, and I am going to start off with one I don't even own, and that is Zombicide Invader. Now, this past Monday, my friend Mike taught four of us, the five total counting him, to play his copy of Zombicide Invader. Now, this was that Kickstarter copy that Mike lent me, and I did a big unboxing video for later in earlier in the week. I think it went a week ago Monday at this point. Uh, this is a huge box with a ton of content, and I'm still amazed Mike actually let me hold on to the game as long as I did, because he has been itching to play it. And now that I've opened everything up for him, he's like, we got to play so do check out our YouTube channel where we have a giant unboxing video where we look through the vast quantity of miniatures and content that came for this game. Yeah, it took an over an hour and 45 minutes to record it all. Thankfully, Sean was able to edit that down, but it's still quite a long video. Now, Mike taught Sean... Uh, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton. Uh, Tom, Deanna, and myself the game, and we played through just the first scenario. I gotta admit, it was a very long teach. Uh, it was a bit of a rough teach. I think Mike needs to watch our episode on teaching games before I have him teach anything else again. Uh, but we did have a bit of fun playing the game. Overall, I found this new Zombicide game to be the best of the bunch so far. Uh, the one I invested the most time in myself was the previous one with uh, the fantasy theme, and I'm totally drawing a blank on the name of it. Um, there are some cool new elements, rule elements in this version from the previous ones, but the basic mechanics and most of the feel is actually the same. I was actually surprised because some of the me mechanics are identical. Like The types of zombies are actually the same in this, except they're aliens. I did find overall that this version felt more like an adventure game and less of a puzzle. And I got to say, I thought that was a good thing. Now, some of the new things included in Invader are robots. The characters can control. So in addition to your six characters, you have two remote control robots. That was kind of neat. Uh, the game itself is set on a space station. And part of that is that part of the board is the space station. The other part is outside. And while you're in space, so when you're outside in space, there's some new rules. Like you have to have oxygen. And they did a neat thing where the guns are either energy type or physical ammo type, and the physical ammo ones don't work outside. 
though I did find it really weird that you still made noise outside if they were going to try to be scientific. But I don't know. Deanna argued there must be some atmosphere. Whatever. Anyway, um, the other thing that's neat is there's this weird mold that's taking over the ship. I don't know what what sci-fi movie that's trying to be inspired from, but this mold slowly spreads from the ship, and then those can be new spawn points. So that added a big random element to the game that wasn't in the previous versions. Now, for those people who aren't aware or haven't yet uh, had a chance to catch our video, you'll see that this is very inspired by media. So yes. there's a lot of media. references for <laughs> uh, Warhammer 40K, for aliens, for and then they bring in a lot of the miniatures, a lot of the stretch goal miniatures are actually characters from other, or yes. insp inspired by characters from other uh, things. There are a lot of serial numbers filed mm -hmm. off on characters in this game but you'll really see a whole lot of aliens and Warhammer 40k inspiration throughout this game. To be honest, there's so much of it. I'm surprised they haven't been sued. Like, like, like they, they, they didn't file the serial. They scratched at him a bit. <laughs> like, like there's some stuff that I'm like, wow, I am surprised they got away with this, but I did again, it is what it is. Uh, one of the things that I was not happy about that they did not fix is yet again, we have another Zombicide game with no campaign play. This has been my complaint about every Zombicide game so far and why I don't have any in my collection. I hate the fact that you've got these 10 scenarios, but every time you reset to zero, like you pick a new character every time and you start with either a small machine gun or a cattle prod, despite my miniature being big ass guy with a big gun. You start with nothing every game. Like the, the first scenario, we had to steal the gun. You don't get the gun when you play scenario two. I, oh, it drives me nuts. Um, I did end up writing up a full blog post about this one, uh, detailing my initial thoughts. I did have quite a bit more to say about it. Uh, check that out for a more in-depth look, because I don't want to dig any deeper here. Now, does Simon do any legacy games? Not yet that I know of. So maybe, maybe if we're, maybe we'll get lucky and uh, the Zombicide uh, will be the first one that finally gets a legacy. Yeah, because I don't know. It, uh, yeah, I mean the the idea after watching the the unboxing, and again, I don't, I, I haven't played the game, I haven't played any of the Zombicide games, but I've watched the unboxing and seen all the content, and to think that there isn't any progression Nothing. in that game is mind-boggling. Nothing, none. And they put out Arcadia Quest. Arcadia Quest is a campaign game. So they have designers that can do campaign games. In Arcadia Quest, you do reset basically, but you still mark off things, and there's a which way path. If you win this mission, you go here. Like, listen to my our episode on campaign games. That wasn't too long ago. It was like, what, four or five episodes ago? Yeah. I get into it. This is not a campaign game. This is a scenario-based cooperative game. Uh, so the last public play event I hosted at Easy Mode, I attempted to teach the competitive card game Lotus. Uh, I think that was two episodes ago. I, I'll just say here and be nice and polite about it and say it didn't go as well as I had hoped. And I wanted to give the game a second chance with the same group of players. Now I got that chance Saturday night, and I got to say I'm glad it went much better. Uh, this time everyone playing was focused on the game and ready to learn it, which was a change from last time. Now it's not that Lotus is hard to learn, but there are some idiosyncrasies with how scoring works. And that's because the player who completes a flower in Lotus gets all the cards used to create the flower. And each card's worth one point, but it's the player with the most guardians on the pedals that unlocks a bonus. And this bonus is five points or the chance to unlock an ability. And it's the two different scoring things that to me actually makes Lotus so fascinating, but there's a lot of strategy and tactics and trying to figure out what cards to play because of this. Like, do you want to play the most of a flower, but then you're taking the risk that someone else is going to complete it and steal it, or it might be worth it if you can make sure you have more guardians. So I don't care if you're going to get the flower. I want the bonus points. Like to me, that's a neat part about it, but it's also the part that's a little hard to teach people. Uh, overall, though, I still really dig it. It is really what I like to call a thinky filler. Uh, thanks, Edward, for Harvey Cardboard for that term. It's a, it's a fantastic term. Uh, this time, all four players really enjoyed the game. They all agreed that this is good. There's enough going on here. I even got thanked for bringing it out and giving it another shot. Yeah, it's interesting there. Uh, the, the score of that on Board Game Geek reflects the sort of difficulty, I think, in, in learning it. Um, it's a six, eight, which isn't bad, That's not but bad it's not all. great. And I think, uh, probably some people's poor first experiences mm -hmm. are, are lowering that. I, I know that there's a frustration of that, but I have area control. Why do you get to take the cards? Like there's a, you definitely get that aspect, especially during your first play. 
Now, this past Saturday, we had the pleasure of joining Tori and Kat for another double date night. It's been about a month since we did this, and if we can keep doing this once a month, I'll be very happy because we had a great time. Uh, we basically did the same thing as last time. We met up the Sandwich Brewing Company, had some great beer, still have the best charcuterie boards in the city, and played some games starting there and then moving back to our host after. Now, one of the games I brought for this was a brand new, new to me game, Pile of Shame Goes Down by One, and that is Imhotep, Builder of Egypt, from the publisher Thames and Cosmos. And this is one of those perfect games for playing during a social event. Uh, something we talked a lot about when we were talking about games at pubs, and Sean liked to, to highlight, is the games where you can not only play and enjoy the game, but also have outside conversations and be social and talk and have fun and have drinks, but still play a game. Uh, we ended up playing Imhotep twice that night, and both games were quite fun. Now, this was another one that I ended up writing up a full initial thoughts review on. Uh, I do suggest checking that out if you want a more detailed look at the game. What I will say here is that it's a really solid gateway family weight game. Uh, it's it's another, it, it could be a, a new Catan. It could be another game to introduce new gamers to gaming. Uh, there are a lot of meaningful decisions to be made. The components are top-notch. Uh, they are they look like your standard resource cubes, but they're about four times bigger, which is nice. And the game boards are all two-sided, and that ramps up the replayability because you can play on either side. Now, there's a mechanical mechanic in this, and Sean may remember playing Zula Reto at his house a long time ago. And that's a game where you have your collecting animals on, uh, what do you call them, trucks. And you can either put animals on your truck or ship them. And this game's obviously inspired by that, because on your turn, you're either loading stone blocks onto a ship or shipping those ships to a site in order to score points. But the thing is, you can ship ships that aren't full and you don't even have to have any of your own blocks on there, which makes it really cutthroat where you're shipping other people's blocks to make sure they don't go where you want to go and stuff like that. Um, all four of us really enjoyed Imhotep. I am looking forward to playing this more. Uh, I want to try out the B-sides of the boards. Uh, there's also expansion I have in my pile of shame, but I'm going to wait till I play this one a few more times. This is one I'm definitely going to be bringing out to easy mode as one of those great intro non-gamer to gamer, gamers dig it, non-gamers dig it kind of games. Yeah, no, it's it's only a two, uh, it's only a two point oh weight, so you know it's it's accessible, but it's not super simple filler mm -hmm. uh, game, which is a really nice way. It's interesting. Uh, they they got a lot of nominations and just not a lot of wins, so I'm wondering. 2016, I think, was a, a a good year for games, so there was a lot of competition out there for the, it won the various something. awards. Um, it won something because my game's got a big golden sticker on it saying it won something. Well, it was. I don't it was, know what. Uh, that's probably Spiel des Jahres nominee. It's got because it, okay, it did maybe. get. A, I, I don't think it was Spiel. It was something else. I don't it know. It did get it's a Spiel nominee, there. but the only the only thing I see listed for it are nominees. All right. Up next. Um, this is once we got back home to our place uh, with Tori and Kat. Tori is a huge fan of deck building games. I think we've mentioned that before. So one of the things I like to do when Tori comes over is show him new deck builders. It's kind of the same thing when Sean comes down. I like to do the same thing because Sean likes deck builders. And I like to show off different ones. So when we got back, I wanted to show off one of the most unique ones in my collection with the ulterior motive of I need to play the expansion for it soon. And that's Eminent Domain from Tasty Minstrel Games. Now, this is a sci-fi deck building game that feels like someone took Race for the Galaxy and turned it into a deck build. And the reason for that is that the heart of the system is role selection, where the person who selects the role, the leader gets to do an action, then every other player can do the same action. And the leader gets a bonus, right? Um, the one change in this game compared to, say, Puerto Rico or other games with I Lead You Follow is that in this game, you can choose not to follow and draw another card. By, it's called Descenting. I either follow or descent and I draw a card. Another thing is this is a deck builder where you don't have to discard your hand at the end of your turn. You literally can choose to keep all your hands if you're set up for your next turn, which I said, it, it, it's really neat. And then the other thing is these roles are represented by cards, and that's where the main deck building is. So when you choose a role, you take a card represented by that role, and it gets added to your deck. So the more you do something, the more cards of that action get added to your deck, which in general means you're going to get better and better at that action, but it can also lead to your deck ending up cluttered with extra cards for actions you no longer need. And that's that's a real problem in this game. Uh, I know my first time in, at the end of the game, I was completely toasted because I only had the wrong type of cards for what actually needed to get done to give me a hope. Even though it was something you needed at the beginning. I think Absolutely. You, you overbought yeah. colonization cards, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yep. Yeah. 
Now, the other deck, deck building aspect to this game is through buying technologies that's using the research rule. Most technology cards end up in your deck, and they're usually improved versions of the normal actions on the roll cards. Uh, they can also be used to boost two different rolls instead of just one like a normal card. So it's just a couple different ways to use them, and there are some permanent technologies. Uh, that's a really high-level overview of this. I didn't want to dig into all the details of eminent domain, but I will say I still really dig it, uh, mainly because it's so different from other deck builders. Like, it is not an evolution of Dominion in any way. I like guess there's a standard mark in the middle. Um, like, it, it doesn't feel like Star Realms. It doesn't feel like any of the other sci-fi card games, or even non-sci-fi. We played two games Saturday night. Uh, of the base game. The first being a learning game, because Tori and Kat had never played it. I would also say a relearning game for Deanna and I, because it had been a while. Uh, and those both went over really well, with the second time being much tighter and more enjoyable. Because I gotta say, like, Sean, I think we only played it once. This is definitely one of those games where you need to see it once to fully understand the card. Yeah, game. no, especially with the, the base game, as I think we're gonna get into when you start talking about expansions, uh, there are portions of that game that aren't perfectly well balanced. Yeah. And, and and learning that your first time through will make a huge difference on your second time through. Very true. Uh, we finished off the night with one more play, and this time we used the Escalation expansion. So this, I was able to get a copy. Thanks, like Mr. The Undead Viking for giving me a review copy at Origins this year. I've been looking forward to trying this for a long time. This expansion has a ton of new technology cards, a completely updated warfare system with updated rules for the ship counters, because in the base game, the ships just mean they're, they're all just ones. Now each ship is a different type, so you actually have like fighters, battle cruisers, and whatever. Um, and then this really neat scenario system that makes the game asymmetric, so that you actually start with different starting hands, and the ability to play five players. Now, at this point, I honestly don't want to say much about Escalation beyond that. Um, I've only played with it once, and as I said, we started at a brewery, and this was the last game of the night. So I will save my thoughts on this expansion for when I manage to get a few more plays under my belt, and ones with a little clearer head. I will just say that I am looking forward to playing it more. Uh, and I have to say, uh, the weakest part of Eminent Domain was definitely the warfare system. So I think it sounds like, uh, at least based on, on the rough overview, that they've yeah. noticed that and taken efforts to, to uh, fix that. And, uh, well, we'll see when the review comes out whether or not they actually achieved it. Yeah, there was definitely way more going on with warfare and way more things you could do. But that's I, I couldn't tell you if it was useful or not. <laughs> I, I know I went 100% Warfare and I felt like the game ended too early and I never got to do all the things, but that's probably because I was way too focused on yeah. building ships. But like I said, I, it wasn't the uh, the best first time playing an expansion, we'll say. All right, well, let's, let's take a look ahead. Now, what do you have planned for the coming week? Uh, so, again, as usual, we're talking about two weeks in the future for the podcast. So this, this coming weekend, uh, for those of you here live who are in Windsor, I am going to be doing a demo night at CD Realm. Uh, it's only either going to be Imhotep or Dead Man's Cabal. Now, the thing is, I was all scheduled, all set to do Dead Man's Cabal, but I know that game came hot off Kickstarter and everything, but they're having a hard time getting it in. So I don't know if that's a Pandasaurus problem, if it's a distributor problem or whatever. I don't know what it is. But the fact they can't get the game in, I don't really want to do a demo night for a game when the store doesn't even have the game for sale. Because I actually think the game's good enough that we might be able to sell, sell a couple copies. So if they can get their shipment in, um, I'm going to find out tomorrow, actually. I'll be doing Dead Man's Cabal. Otherwise, though, I'm going to do Imhotep because I just played it for the first time on the weekend. I'm really digging it. Uh, it's an older game, 2016, so it's something they're likely to have in stock. And I kind of want to show this one off. Now, the following week, that's the 21st of September. This is the one for you guys listening to the podcast. You people listen to the podcast this coming Saturday. We are back at easy mode from 10 till from 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. Uh, I'm definitely bringing Imhotep as well as a bunch of other lighter games. I'll make sure to bring Terraforming Mars as well because there was a big group that really liked uh, Terraforming Mars last time I was there. So like I said before, when I try to go to easy mode, I try to bring a mix. We do get a lot of new gamers out. And I say Imhotep's going to be perfect for that, I think. All right. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. <sighs> Roger Linscott Jr., thank you. Brian Kurtz, thanks. Yuho Rutila, thank you. Duran Barnett, thanks. Evil John, Mr. Carney, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. 
that means my shift is coming to an end. We're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at Watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers on YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday. You can also catch the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. We mostly play Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. And our new tradition of raiding another tabletop gaming Twitch streamer at the end of the night. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.